Desmond Patton's introduction with a message with a message of happy birthday. Full disclosure, it's tomorrow. <laughs> Keep this in mind. Or I could be shady and ask how great is the food in New York City. Or I could simply ask, why'd you have to go? To induce sympathy. Instead, I will thank him. Why? Because he has dedicated his life and his academic career to studying the populations that are often invisible. Those populations that the media often turns, if not a blind eye, a very negative one. Because representation is everything. Because knowing he was a part of our faculty, a member of our school somehow made this space less isolating. Because the success of black men and young people of color in general is interwoven in the fabric that is the success of this nation, whether they see it and value it as we do or not. Because social media is no longer the way of the future, this is the future. <clears throat> the future is now. And I'd like to thank him for guiding us into it. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Dr. Desmond Patton. What an amazing introduction. So you, you all can go home now. I think you've you, you covered it. Um, it's, it's really great to be back um, at the University of Michigan. But I am super excited to get a chance to have a conversation with Zelia Mani. Um, and so, kind of how the format is going to work uh, this, this evening. This is, he and I are going to have a conversation. Um, we're going to try to make it as natural as possible um, so that you can learn more about his work um, and how his work um, and impacts social change. Um, so, without further ado, we're just going to get started. Zelia, what's up, buddy? <laughs> it's uh, so good just to have you here, um, and welcome to the University of Michigan. Uh, I, I've been uh, a follower of you on Twitter for a very long time, and I've just been so impressed with the work that you've done uh, for our community. I'm just curious if you can just tell us, we need a microphone. Blue, uh, okay, great. Um, I'm wondering if you could just uh, tell me more about how you got to this space. So, your life, how you got to this particular space at this time. I would say that things for me started as an activist and organizer in college. But I would say that I follow a tradition that kind of started in my own life, right? that my parents participated in some, in the student college movement that occurred in the 60s and 70s. Um, my parents used to always tell me stories and really, you know, was really proud of the fact that they took over their Bursar's office in North New Jersey, right, to demand the same things that we find ourselves demanding of our college administrations to this day. So I found myself, you know, wanting to go to college one day and, you know, run up in the in the Bursar's office as well and make demands. So I grew up knowing about Frederick Douglass and Huey P. Newton and Malcolm X and a lot of heroes that my peers did not learn about in the elementary school setting that we had with the history books or whatnot. But I would say that one of the things that really radicalized me was this one statement. George Bush does not care about black people. And this is very, very important to me. And um, Professor Neil had touched up on this earlier, that at that time when Kanye West had made those statements, it was also around the same time that YouTube was emerging. Right? So what that happened was we did not have to rely to catch it on the mainstream media for to see the replay. We can actually pull it up on our college campus and repeat it as many times as we want to. At that point in time, I was the president of an organization called Brothers for Awareness, and we held a meeting 
probably a, a week after Hurricane Katrina or whatnot, and I set up my laptop, and there had to be around like 50 students crowding around our laptop watching Kanye West say this. And for them, it was the first time that they had heard him say it, right? That they missed the live coverage, they missed the repeats, but we can actually play it right there, you know, let it buffer you know, for like five minutes or whatever. <laughs> But that for us was something that was very, very important and radicalized us to something that was taking place, you know, and somewhere far away. So for many of us, um, you know, social media isn't necessarily this tool that we use for activism. You know, for me, I joined Facebook in 2004 and was on there to talk, <laughs> meet, meet friends, reconnect with friends and talk. But, but for you, when did, it, when did it change over for you? When did it become this thing that you felt you could use um, to activate the things, you, the things that you care about? For a while when I first joined Twitter, I joined it in 2011, I just used it as a space to talk about black stuff, right? Black culture, black art, black literature, um, anything that was going on in black news, I was talking about on Twitter. But it really wasn't until Trayvon Martin was killed in Florida that we seen um, a change in how people were using Twitter at that point in time, right? That we have to remember at that point that the media, the mainstream media, was not covering Trayvon Martin's death. It was not on mainstream media, it was not really on local news outlets, and definitely wasn't on the cable networks. It wasn't until people started to in about it more and more and more, and his name became trending on hashtags that it was being able to be picked up on national media. And because a lot of things was going on in the summertime in regards to George Zimmerman's trial, and I was off for work, I was able to watch the trial and tweet everything to people every single day. So people that was at home or out, or at work, they was able to follow me on Twitter to get an updates on the trial. And that was one of the things that really activated me. But I would definitely say on August 9th, 2014, when Mike Brown was brutally killed by Darren Wilson, that that's what really um, thrusted me into using social media as uh, a way or a tool to activize. Yeah. So you, really played an important role in the documentation, the archiving of many of these events that have really um, uh, brought to the forefront um, a lot of hatred and racism that still permeates in our society. But uh, what have you learned from your documentation process? And what have you gained from being in the social media space for your own, for your own self? One of the things that I've learned is that a lot of people have been doing this work already, right? And that sometimes social media, it's like a double-edged sword, right? That it gives some people visibility, but at the same time, it can erase people. And that's the most dangerous part about social media. It can uplift a lot of people, but at the same time, it can collect and erase others. So that's one of the main things that um, I've learned during this experience. But I've also witnessed the amount of love that we have in this movement that a lot of times mainstream media or conservatives, they will try to label this movement as a movement of hate. And I always say, no, that's not true. This is a movement of love. We love humanity and we definitely love black humanity. And this fight is a movement of love. It's not a movement of hate. And in between the police and the protesters and the lies and rebellion, that's where I found love. In the midst of all this tear gas, in the midst of rubber bullets, I found love through this kinship of strangers that I'd never met before. Before I went down to Ferguson, I sent out tweets and Tumblr messages saying, hey, I'm going down to Ferguson, who lives down there? And people would hit me up and say, hey, I'm already down here, you can stay with me, I'll pick you up. Complete strangers I was staying with, I was riding around with, that I was willing to die with. I think it's really cool that you bring up the, this aspect of social media that it, that oftentimes gets omitted from the conversation around that it really is a network 
that it allows activists and organizers to connect with their people to find their community. And one of the sessions I was part of, one young lady said that it helped her to be safe. She could figure out which roads to travel down, who to talk to, where to go, um, where to get food and that kind of thing. Uh, but one of the things that you mentioned that I wanted to um, talk more about is um, who gets um, eliminated from the conversation. And one thing that we've been talking about that has been a, a theme throughout the day is um, the gender politics of social media activism, in part, um, uh, young, young black queer women um, started uh, Black Lives Matter, uh, this hashtag, but um, many believe that young black men have become the face of uh, Black Lives Matter. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, that's, that's, that's really complex because it's an ongoing dialogue that's going on right now, right? That even when you just refer to right now that um, three you know, black queer women started the movement, and we have to think about it, did they start the movement, right? Did they start the movement? Because for most of us, we didn't learn about Black Lives Matter so way after the Ferguson eruption erupted, right? The people who poured into the streets after Mike Brown was killed, they did not know about the Black Lives Matter hashtag. They did not know about the three women who created the hashtag when Trayvon Martin died. They went out into those streets because they saw the tweet messages about um, a young man in Ferguson who was killed um, by a police officer. And when we look at it, when we look at the, the data, it was maybe over 100,000 tweets on that one day that Mike Brown was killed. Over 100,000 tweets about Mike Brown or Ferguson in regards to his death. Um, maybe around three days later when the first bullet or first rubber bullet was used to disperse crowds, the amount of Twitter activity jumped up to 500,000 tweets. 500,000 tweets of people tweeting about what was going on. And the number kept on going up and up as the police and the state aggression started to um, surmount. So around, I believe, August 13th, when two reporters were arrested because they did not leave McDonald's fast enough, the tweets jumped up to over like 1,700,000 tweets that particular day, right? Um, that's over like 4,000 tweets a minute. And during the whole span of August to December, over 10%, over 10% of Twitter activity was in regards to what was going on in Ferguson. That's 10%, you know? And still thinking that the black population just only represented like a small portion of um, black or Twitter. So um, it gave people a space gave people a way to talk about things that they never had a chance to talk about, and it gave people a way to dialogue when they didn't have a dialogue before. Um, I necessarily don't think that black men were um, given, you know, put as the face of the movement. I think early on, even early on, it was a real intentional effort to make sure that this was inclusive and that it was well known that you know women are leading this effort and that this is a woman-led movement. So you you raised some really important points that I think are really um, uh, surrounding how do we think about leadership in a, a social media activist space, and so. It, a part of it seems to be is that we we don't really have accurate or reliable ways of measuring leadership or thinking about leadership in this space. Um, so, a just what are your thoughts around leadership? Should there be leadership? Um, and if there isn't leadership, how does that affect the ability for social media activists to affect change? Yes, it makes me think a lot about. Ferguson, when a lot of the riots was taking place, that a lot of young people, both men and women, were standing out in front of the stores, protecting the stores. Right? So I remember this one particular night, uh, the police did not shoot tear gas, they did not shoot rubber bullets, they just watched everything. Right? I remember this one group of people threw a brick 
at a beauty shop and started rushing in, right? And then a group of young men like ran over there to stand in the front and guard. And it was like it was like Crips, right? A bunch of Crips. Like you think that they was running inside it's still not. Nah. A bunch of Crips from the neighborhood that was standing in front of um the beauty shop saying, nah, you guys not gonna be robbing this. This is not what this is about, all right? And then more and more people started to run to different beauty sh um different shops that was on that strip called West Florissant, and it contained, you know, women as well that was like guarding the shops saying, no, you guys not robbing this. But what happened was the pictures of the men guarding the shops started to circulate on social media. And they started to circulate not necessarily because um, they wanted to highlight the fact that it was men, but the fact that the women did not want their pictures to be taken. So because the women did not want their pictures to be taken, it was kind of erased from that narrative and it was not being able to be uplifted. So a lot of times what happens is that I'm scared and I'm fearful of this, that maybe in current times, maybe that people that was present know about the, the roles that the women played in that particular time or movement, but as time eclipses and time goes forward, that memory gets washed away and we lose sight of what happens, right? So I wonder if you could talk more about just the media and the role of the media in the work that you do. Um, how does it influence your work? Um, particularly as we're thinking about who was lifted up as leaders, who was put out front, that kind of thing. So I'm thinking about how what happened was really, really organic in the sense that none of us was attempting to be leaders at all. I can speak about you know a few people that may name or know from Twitter, like Netta. Anyone know Netta from Twitter? Um, there was Alexis and Brittany also from Twitter. They're the leaders from Mal. And it was just people that was doing the work and we was using social media so effectively that the media was just really focusing on a handful of people to um, get questions from or get quotes from. And that kind of sometimes erases other people from um, the narrative. What do you think is next? So there's been, we, we, we um, see a host of hashtags that many people are now familiar with that have now um, created these really interesting and nuanced activist spaces. Um, how, how is this sustainable? How does this keep moving? Well, there's two things that's, that's happening, I believe, that we're able to create. First thing is that I mentioned earlier is that this tool is allowing us to name the systems of oppression, and it's also giving us the opportunity to start to challenge and confront them. But at the same time, it's giving us a space to create alternate visions of what the society that we want to potentially live in in the future. And I think that's going to be the most important step going on, is that not only are we going to be confronting state violence and police violence, but we're also pushing people to imagine the world without police and imagine the world without prisons. That's the most fearful thing for a lot of people. When you tell them, you know, we don't want police in prisons at all, because a lot of people's first impression is like, whoa, 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 no police. How are we going to be safe? What's going to happen? But when you really think about it, right, that the suburban communities or predominantly white communities, they're not safe because there's a lot of police. Because if you look at it, it's not a lot of police, right? The reason why they're safe is because they have access to the resources, right? They have access to healthcare, they have access to good jobs and quality jobs. So what we really need to do in order to really, really challenge this is not only tell people that you know we want to dismantle the police, but we need to divest from the police and invest in our communities as well. So what happens when there's no more Twitter? When Twitter goes defunct or you know the platforms change how does that affect the movement I'm not too sure about that right now I'm not too sure because I don't think any of us knew how effective of a tool Twitter was going to be but now that we have this opportunity to connect with people all across the country just by using hashtags that 
when the fraternity SAE um, was on the bus and there was chanting, and even in Canada as well, and that this racism is not just by fraternities, but it's by other groups and also within the, the higher educational spaces. But within that hashtag, not just SAE, it not only allowed us to dialogue amongst each other, but it also allowed us to form relationships. And this is very, very important. It allowed us to form these relationships that sustained itself almost a year later when we wanted to do the, the student blackout protest. So almost everybody that was participating in the not just UVA and the not just SAE and the Black All Campus hashtags was able to also um, coordinate offline to talk amongst each other to come up with the student blackout protest that emerged um, last fall. What's most challenging about social media? So we, you know, most of the day has been around, around the positive activities and experiences that people can have on social media that we can that we certainly want to uplift and encourage. But what's challenging or problematic about these platforms that may um, hinder your work as well? The trolls. <laughs> the trolls are off off I block like fifty or so trolls per day. Um, and this is just not on Twitter. I get trolls on Facebook. I get trolls on um, Tumblr as well. Like nasty, nasty, like death threats. I had this person sending me death threats like literally hourly, hourly. Like, I will wake up to like death threats saying, you know, I just want to gut you and see your blood on, you know, on the wall like every single hour. I'm like, does he work? Like. <laughs> He's talking about, you know, black people need to be working. Are you working right now? Because you have a lot of time in your man, right? So I think the trolls and the hate really wears down on your psyche. And it's, 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 it's something that a lot of us are still trying to navigate, you know? And it's um, taking a toll on a lot of people's mental health. As we continue to think about mental health, um, I know um, earlier this week, um, one of the Black Lives activists um, committed suicide, and um, I certainly wanted to, to have us think about self-care in this space. What does that look like for you? Self-care looks like knowing when to say no. Being able, not saying maybe when you really want to say no, right? That you're going to get a lot of people to request things from you, services from you, favors from you, and you have to be able to say no. You're going to have to be able to step back from a lot of things, um, remove yourself from a lot of positions, remove yourself from a lot of um, aggression and a lot of trauma because um, we're living in a, in a different world. Not in the sense that there's more violence taking place than there was in the past. There's not more racism taken down than in the past. But I think that because of um, social media, we see it so often, right? It's like every time you scroll through your timeline, it's another picture, it's another video, it's another black body laying in the street, it's another black body being shot, right? It's, it's another name to try to memorize. It's another name that you try to fit in the hashtag with your 140 character tweets. And it just gets so traumatizing that we always have to respond to our trauma, right? That when someone dies, you don't have that time to just like grieve, to think about it and to sit in that moment. It's like, okay, what are we gonna do now? Like how are we going to organize around this, you know? Or you get calls saying, all right, Zella, we need you here. We need you to help us organize. And it's never a moment to say, hey, guys, like, you know, this is taking a toll for me. I'm hurting, too. Let me just, you know, take a step back from this. So uh, I'm curious about uh, your lives, the social media activists. I'm, I'm curious about what you all do together. Um, I think it's always a little interesting. You, know, you all are doing such a powerful work, um, um, but we don't get to see you because you're, you know, you're, you're on social media. So how do you all interact 
what do you all do for fun? How do you all do this work um, and, and stay smiling and, and, and present? It's jokes all the time. You know? All the time we got jokes with amongst each other, um, you know, against the movement, um, against the police. It's always jokes. Even in, in Ferguson, after being tear gassed, like we go back to the car and we have jokes, right? <laughs> Um, I remember this one time there was, um, when the National Guard was in Ferguson and there was a curfew and we wanted to go out there and see if um, anyone was out there being tear gassed and we was walking down the dark street, right? It was dark, we didn't think nobody would be able to see us and then there was a, um, like a police van with a spotlight and all of a sudden it like shined on us, right? We was like, oh! <laughs> and we all like took off running like laughing, right? And then like we all like jumped in the cars and kind of like hid under the seats because we saw that the police cars were now like coming down slowly down the streets flashing their, their flashlights in between, you know, the cars to see like who was out there, right? And um, after the police, you know, passed us, they were like, you know, we sped off like laughing, you know, because even in those moments of fear and um, potential violence, like we still had the opportunity to, you know, laugh about it, joke about it. And, you know, even when we went back to the hotel room, we would even have jokes like, man, we smell like, you know, like um, sweat, tear gas, and freedom. <laughs> and that was like, that was all um, a little line. We smelled like sweat, tear gas, and freedom. But we always had these moments to like laugh and, and um, crack jokes. Even our meetings go super long because it gets interrupted. Like, let me tell you what this white person said to me today. <laughs> So we like stop our meetings, like wow, what they said, you know, and you know it gets derailed all the time. Faculty meetings. Um, <laughs> uh, so my final question for you is: uh, many people don't know that you're a teacher, and so I'm wondering if you could just tell us what do you want your youth to know based on the work that you do, the activism that you're engaged in. What do you want them to know that's not in the textbook? I want them to love themselves unapologetically. I want to definitely want them to love themselves unapologetically. I remember this one particular time when I was um, teaching and I asked my class to volunteer to read a passage um, from the book. It was poetry. And one of the young girls, she volunteered to read this passage and you know she read it beautifully, right? beautifully. And as soon as she finished reading it, another boy in the classroom said, you read like a white girl. You read like a white girl. And in that moment, I could see her just like shut down, right? Just shut down. Because at that moment, she had really had two options. She had two options. One was that, which was the most violent, was that she could succumb to this microaggression, because that's what it was, a microaggression. Or two, she could push back from that microaggression and continue to read as beautifully as she did and articulately as she did. Because the most dangerous option was dangerous because she had the potential of changing her speech pattern, right? Because that's a lot of kids do because they don't want to sound smart because they'll get teased, right? And then we have the kids who, the kids who can't read who will get teased. So you have kids in the class who play dumb and get teased, and you have the kids who may not read as well and still get teased, right? So it's one of those things where you try to have your kids be, um, feel safe in that environment, feel safe to be themselves, feel safe to mess up, and um, just be themselves. Thank you so much for just your time and, and just uh, enlightening us this afternoon. We've certainly learned a lot. So can we please give Zelly a big round of applause?